that conference president, later became a union president, and then he decided that it was time that I should be ordained as a pastor. And at a huge camp meeting with many speakers from overseas, some of whom are dead now already, one of them was uh, Richard O'Phil, oh, remember him? Yes, yes. Uh, they were all there when I was ordained as a pastor. Now, the ordination in itself is like a, a stamp of approval of the church. So it's something to cherish. Mm -hmm. But it's also a passport to be able to preach. Exploded and created everything. It is because I so greatly desire to work for the salvation of souls that I do not give up to infirmities. I am determined that as long as God permits me to live, I will proclaim the message of warning to the world. I want my voice to reach many more before I shall give up my labors. But not all countries are as happy to accept <laughs> this kind of preaching. And some, particularly uh, in Europe, were very anti and would not appreciate the fact that I actually was ordained. But that doesn't make the ordination undone. And no matter what the trials are, no matter what the tribulations are, I've learned over the years that the greater the opposition to the truth, the more prominent the truth becomes. Yeah. So if you go to Europe, for example, and a church leader makes a huge noise and warns everybody never to attend that man's lectures, it's the best advertisement that could be made, mm -hmm. and then the halls are full. Yeah. Remember that? Yes, I remember. That How many time. times that happened? Yes. But the, coming, coming back to the president who ordained you, at that camp meeting, he, he appreciated evangelism. And at that camp meeting, he said, people, we are going to take up money, when we take up the, uh, the offering today, it's going to go to evangelism. And, and they were all against him and said, no, it has to go to... They were in debt. To cover the debt of yes. the church. They were in debt. And then he said, no, we are going to use it for evangelism. And can you remember what happened then? They said, all right, let's take up a second offering yes. then. So they took up the biggest offering they had ever, ever taken up and it went all to evangelism. evangelism and he said let's take up a second offering and through that offering the entire church came out of debt yes so god is amazing he wants you to to think about his message first and 
all these things will, will be, be added, added unto you. Yes. So when in Europe they preach against the truth and they try to prevent you from preaching, it does nothing other than advertising. Mm -hmm. And when they accused me before the courts of Germany, and eventually that investigation took one year to complete and you didn't know what the outcome was going to be. They told you that you must be ready to, to go fly there and to be in court. Yes, and then maybe be imprisoned. Yes. And the government f exonerated me completely. And then you would expect the church to say, well, sorry, we made a mistake. But to this day, that has not been forthcoming. But it doesn't matter. No. Uh, the people know what the truth is. And God knows. And God knows what the truth is. And the truth will triumph no matter what they do. And uh, they ban me. They ban me from the churches. I may not preach in the churches. Well, then I'll preach in a hall. Because they have to ask themselves the question, in the time of the disciples, did they tell them that they were no longer to preach in this name? All the time. And what did they say? They went and preached in his name. And they said, we have to obey God more, more than, than man. man. So if I am convinced in my mind and in my heart that the Lord has placed this burden of this message onto my heart. If I don't preach it, then I'm working against my conscience. So they can shout as much as they like. Now, if their shouting convinced me that there were no fruits, then I would stop. But if their shouting just proves to me that more and more people embrace the truth, mm. then no matter how much they shout, I will ignore them until God tells me to stop preaching this message. There are many people that write to us and say they were Catholic, they were atheists, they were evolutionists, they were, they were occultists. Yes. And they've come out and they have embraced the truth. Yes, we've got one after the other. People that have come out of secret societies, people that have come out of secret military organizations. We have, there are so many people. And the interesting thing to me is that it covers the entire spectrum from the poorest of the poor to the most famous of the most famous, from film stars to people with very little education. And it covers the entire spectrum. Mm. And you say to yourself, should they not have the opportunity to hear this truth? Of course. One leader told me, very prominent leader, he said to me, you will not preach these things. You will stop immediately. And he commanded me to stop. And I walked out of there and I said, Lord, what do I do with this? And as I walked out, a young man came and hugged me and said, I was a new ager. Thank you for preaching the truth. And I walked into a hall and Uncle Frenchy was with me and the man came up to me and said, thank you for preaching the truth, I have accepted it. And he was a neurosurgeon. <laughs> and then a third one came and he was an evolutionary geologist and he had accepted the truth. And I said to him, should they not believe these things? Mm. So I could safely ignore what that person had said. Why do they say these things? Because they love, like our cat, to bask in the sunshine of acceptance with the other churches. They are, and uh, you they can't are listen scared. to that. They are scared, maybe even scared of consequences that, uh, for persecution, I think the spirit of prophecy says very clearly that when persecution comes, those people will, will not have been fortified through the trials for standing for the truth. Yes, in this world, you will have tribulation. Yeah. I expect to have trials, but I do not dread them. The Lord knows what I can bear. He will give me strength to endure. 
He will sustain me in my weakness, enabling me to follow on and to know that his going forth is prepared as the morning. As the sun sets behind me, I cannot help but wonder whether the sand of time for this world is running out. We have been traveling through the whole of Europe on the footsteps of the Reformation. What is it that drives us? We believe that God's people in the end of time must be restorers of the breach, restorers of paths to dwell in. We believe that the commandments of God that have been downtrodden must be restored. We believe that the world needs to hear a message, the three angels' message as recorded in the chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. And we have been in some remarkable situations. God has opened doors for us. It was incredible. We got into places and stood in places where we never thought we would be able to stand. As the sun sets, I believe the sunset of this world is very, very near. And we have to make an individual choice. We cannot hide behind the ecclesiastical powers. We cannot hide behind the authorities of the world. We have to base our decisions on the Word of God. And therefore today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart.